If there's any video game on earth that I would consider to be truly perfect, even though I don't play it much myself, it would probably be Tetris. In its simplicity, it knows exactly what it wants to do, and has a handful of simple rules to accomplish the experience it sets out to offer for the player. It's a game with a singular, pointed focus. It seeks to create the most satisfying and addicting gameplay loop within those small boundaries. And it succeeded. It's not an awe-striking spectacle, nor is it intimidatingly complex. It's a quick, easy, gratifying puzzle game. And it perfected being a quick, easy, gratifying puzzle game. Making the perfect game is very difficult. It becomes even more difficult as that game grows in scope and adds numerous more systems, mechanics, and functions. The more moving parts a video game has, the more points of potential failure it has, and therefore, the harder it is to make it perfect. It's why I'm such a staunch supporter of more linear games that understand their limits. It's much more satisfying for me as an individual and as a player to engage with gameplay mechanics that are narrow but deep, as opposed to wide but shallow. One of the most disappointing things a game of great scope can do is introduce a lot of potentially interesting and impactful gameplay functions or concepts and basically go nowhere with them. Starfield was first revealed to the world at E3 2018, with only a very short teaser trailer that gave us the title of the game. After that, it was radio silence for three years until we saw in-engine footage in 2021, and from that point on, marketing slowly started to ramp up, giving us more gameplay and information, and eventually, a release date set for November 11th, 2022, the 11th birthday of Bethesda's own Skyrim. Unfortunately, but unsurprisingly, the game was hit with a delay, pushing it deep into 2023 territory. Led by the one and only Todd Howard, he and his colleagues at Bethesda painted a very promising and ambitious picture of what they intended to do with a project of this magnitude. A spacefaring sci-fi game that took players planet to planet, star to star. The studio is no stranger to scope, so for many people, if anyone could do it, it was them. Eight years since the release of their previous big single-player adventure, Fallout 4, Bethesda had some high expectations looming over them, with people hanging on every word about Starfield and the overdue upgrade to Creation Engine 2. Five years after its reveal, Starfield is finally here. I bought it, I played it, and now it's time for me to give my thoughts. Did Bethesda truly live up to the cosmic hype, or did they crumble beneath their starry ambitions? Let's begin the review and find out. Normally, when I do reviews, I have a pretty specific format. I start off discussing the story, characters, and setting, then move on to performance, graphics, and music, and finally I head into the important stuff, the gameplay. And after that, I might touch on miscellaneous stuff that doesn't really fit anywhere else or go over replayability or New Game Plus if the game offers it. In some cases, I'll dive into spoiler territory with proper warning. However, for this Starfield review, I'm going to change things up a bit and adopt a new layout. Rather than follow my usual shtick, I'm making it more straightforward and easy to digest. I'm going to divide this review into two parts. Things I liked and things I didn't like. Period. And the reason why I'm doing this is because there's just so many aspects of this game that I want to comment on individually, I think it would make the process of writing this review more complicated if I stuck to my normal routine. So I'm making an exception here and doing it differently. So let's start with the things about Starfield that I liked. Let's put a more positive foot forward. First is shipbuilding. I know you're probably surprised to hear that being the first thing mentioned in this section, but I really cannot overstate how much I enjoyed editing ships or making completely new ones. The shipbuilding system was something I expected to not touch, because I didn't imagine it would be all that important in the long term. Turns out, 
I was incorrect on both accounts. Not only is shipbuilding key in adding strength, longevity, and utility to your ride, but it's also super fun to just do. Right off the bat, you get an impressive number of parts, or modules, to install, and you will unlock more as you invest in the right skills. Putting a ship together in Starfield is like building one with Legos. It's simple, effective, and surprisingly intuitive. There's only a handful of real rules regarding how you can build. Your ship has several stats to keep track of, so you would think managing them while making changes would be kinda difficult. But that's not the case. Despite my initial reluctance about the system, shipbuilding ended up being one of the more fun activities you can engage with in the entire game. Speaking of building things, the next positive about the game is the character creator. It's definitely the most robust one Bethesda has made so far. I remember the days before Skyrim, in Oblivion and Fallout 3, when it was almost impossible to make your character look even remotely attractive. We've seen some improvements since then, but as of now, Starfield is the biggest leap forward in this department. There's sliders galore when you're making your character. And with enough time and finesse, you can make your character look like just about any real-life person. It really is a very good creator. Another thing I like about Starfield is the general aesthetics. Obviously, the majesty of viewing a planet from the vacuum of space or from the point of view of its moon makes for some excellent wallpaper material. There's no denying that. I've absolutely caught myself gazing at the great beyond while wandering around a random rock more than once. The game absolutely manages to take advantage of the visual aspect of its obscenely huge scope. I also like the look of the UI. It's very much inspired by retro-futurism, judging by the typeface choice, but at the same time it's merged with the sleekness of more modern menus. It is visually appealing, even though the menus themselves continue the annoying Bethesda game trend of not conveying all the useful information they should convey, and leaving a lot of empty space lying around. Continuing the subject of visuals, though, another thing I like is the detail in the environmental and object assets. I can definitely tell that the art team was busting their ass to make all the stuff in Starfield look sufficiently futuristic, and I think they knocked it out of the park. Interiors and exteriors, weapons and gear, and random decorations all look sleek and cool. No matter how many times I see them, I can't help but spend a couple seconds admiring the design of a gun when I'm equipping it. They just look so badass. Next is combat, which is actually pretty solid and serviceable. Up until Fallout 4, Bethesda had a major weakness in gun combat, and honestly combat in general but Starfield is definitely the best feeling shooter they've made so far. Granted, it's still not perfect, because some weapons still feel kinda weak even though functionally and statistically they do good damage. It's just, the perception of actual power within the game's universe is undertuned. Their sound design isn't so punchy, and enemies don't react so viscerally, partly due to a lack of gore. Meaning, no head popping with a sniper rifle or a revolver, and no blasting limbs off with a shotgun. Kinda disappointing. Plus, melee isn't all that varied either. Outside of that though, I don't dislike combat. And unlike with Fallout 3 back in the day, I'm not trying to actively avoid it. As an extension of combat, there's also the boost pack, a little jet your character wears for extra height in jumps. It's quite fun and useful, and there's multiple types. Extra mobility options in games are almost always a net positive. If Starfield just had a grappling hook I could use on both the environment and enemies, I would be actively looking for fights. And then there's lockpicking, which I actually kinda enjoy in Starfield. It's pretty rare for me to not want to skip or avoid picking locks in video games because usually their associated minigame is boring, tedious, or downright poorly explained and confusing. But the circular slotting puzzle for Starfield's lockpicking is actually kind of fun for me. I don't hesitate at all when I see something locked. I'm totally willing to jump into the puzzle and tackle it, no matter the difficulty. There's also photo mode, which has become a staple of the modern era of AAA games. 
and the photo mode in Starfield, while not super robust, is still very snappy and easy to use, with all the basic options you would expect from it, including a lot of filters. The player character is not voiced, which feels like a small thing to really care about, but it was a point of contention for Fallout 4, because having a voiced protag can severely limit the variety and dialogue responses. And considering how often you can choose what to say, making your character unvoiced again was almost certainly the right choice for Starfield. And speaking of dialogue, the act of hailing and talking to random ships out in space is also quite fun and varied. I didn't do it constantly, but I was pretty surprised at how many different interactions there were, including meeting an old woman named Grandma who invites you on board to give you food, helping out stranded people, or getting pranked by weirdos who tell a joke and then graph jump away. And finally, there's a few smaller details that I enjoy or appreciate, like ammunition being weightless and encumbrance still allowing you to move but just preventing fast travel and making you spend oxygen faster. Sadly, this is where the list of things I liked about Starfield ends. Now we're going to go into the list of things I didn't like. As you probably expected from the title of this video and the introduction of it, the majority of the game is going to be in this part. Before I get started, I just want to preemptively address two things. First, I love spacefaring science fiction, so I really did want to love Starfield, even in spite of my continually strained relationship with Bethesda games. I started the game with the idea in my head that if Bethesda could just knock this one experience out of the park, then as far as I'm concerned, all my faith in them as a developer would be restored and stronger than ever. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Not even close. Second, I'm sure someone listening to this is going to turn this into a really weird console war thing, and I'm just going to put a stop to that right now by saying I loved Obsidian's Pentiment and Tango's Hi-Fi Rush. I have glowing reviews of both of those games on this channel, and I wholeheartedly recommend them to pretty much everyone and anyone. My disappointment in Starfield has nothing to do with exclusivity, console warring, or with ZeniMax now being owned by Microsoft in general. Oh, and this is officially where spoilers are going to begin. I'm going to go over a lot of things, from the main quest line, to companions, to exploration, all the way to New Game Plus and the weird discourse it spawned. You have been warned. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's continue on. First is the main quest line. The story of Starfield actually does a pretty good job at quickly establishing a promising mystery. You start off your new job as a miner on some backwater moon looking for some precious minerals, but you discover some enigmatic artifact that gives you visions when you touch it. Then you're immediately thrust into the world of Constellation, a group of adventurers who seek to uncover the galaxy's greatest mysteries by searching for more of these artifacts. Sounds pretty interesting, right? Well, narratively, yes, it does seem like it could go into fascinating directions. Structurally and mechanically, however, it is Bethesda's most boring, fetch questy, bullshit main questline they've probably ever made. The search for more artifacts goes like this. Go to a planet, enter a cave, mine, or lab, fight either mercenaries or pirates, take artifact, return it to Constellation to add to their collection. Then you go to a different planet, enter a different cave, mine, or lab, fight more mercenaries or pirates, take the artifact there and return it to Constellation. Then you go to another planet, enter another cave, mine, or lab, fight even more mercenaries or pirates, take another artifact and return it to Constellation. I think you see where I'm going with this. Literal fetch quests make up the backbone of the main quest line. I don't think I need to explain why that's such a ridiculously boring, unfulfilling, and uninteresting thing that totally cripples the narrative experience and undermines any sort of impact it would have otherwise had. And it doesn't even stop there. Later, once enough progress is made, you unlock special powers, comparable to shouts in Skyrim 
Yeah, really creative. But to acquire these powers, you need to do another type of fetch quest where you visit temples spread across the galaxy. And instead of fighting the same mercenaries and pirates over and over again, you have to do a very annoying zero gravity game of tag with spinning lights, which you will absolutely fucking hate after the first time. But you need to do it every time you enter a temple to get a new power. And there's 24 powers in total, each with 10 levels, and each level requires another temple. Meaning that stupid, flying, time-wasting game of catch will need to be done a grand total of 240 times to max out all powers. Temples are so bad, they feel like Bethesda is intentionally trying to sabotage their own game. Again, fetch quests are the backbone of the main story, and it is downright miserable. Of course, you do get quests on occasion that allow you to spend some time with your constellation companions, and on even rarer occasions, they might have some sort of interesting mission gimmick. But those are in the minority compared to the artifact and space power collectathons, and they don't actually change the fetch questing nature of the mission, they just add more dialogue. Normally, that could be good because you want to interact with your companions as much as you can, but ultimately, it's kinda just polishing a turd. And speaking of companions, they are my next complaint, and there's a couple of things to complain about when it comes to them. First is their writing. To be blunt, the members of Constellation are extremely judgmental, lawful or neutral good aligned dimwits, and their personalities are just slight variations from one another. Sarah Morgan enjoys science and being nice to people. Barrett enjoys science and being nice to people, and also making jokes. Sam Coe enjoys freedom and being nice to people. Andrea enjoys freedom and being nice to people. The only human constellation member I actually wanted to travel with was Walter, and he's the CEO of a ship manufacturer, so by all accounts, he's the most likely to be an asshole on paper. But he's actually really chill and charismatic, but he's not available as a permanent companion. So my last choice is Vasco the Robot. Now, for the most part, I actually didn't mind my fellow Constellation members all that much. But, it was when I did one specific faction questline that I realized how fucking shallow and unbearable they were, and it totally annihilated any sort of enjoyment I had with them. The United Colonies questline. In this questline, you discover that big, nasty monstrosities called terror morphs are popping up in planets they shouldn't be on, and could spread across the galaxy at an alarming rate. The questline ends with the player making a decision on how to get rid of them. The first choice is reintroducing their natural predator, a giant giraffe-like beast called the Aceles, to planets the terror morphs have shown up at. The second choice is releasing a microbe that infects and kills terramorphs with extreme efficiency. But of course, there's a few details to know about each one. Reintroducing the Aceles will take years, but the good news is that humans have introduced them to various ecosystems on different planets before to significant success. And on top of that, despite being the terramorphs natural predator, they're actually docile to humans and we've even used them as livestock at some point. For all intents and purposes, the only weakness to the Aceles choice is the fact that it'll take a longer time to work. The microbe, on the other hand, may be efficient and pragmatic, but not only is it untested, the scientists in the game verbally state that there's no guarantee terror morphs won't eventually develop an immunity, nor any guarantee that the microbe itself won't mutate to infect non terramorph fauna, including humans themselves. So, I picked the greener and safer option of the Aceles. Surely my companions would agree with that decision, right? Wrong. I get on my ship, and all of them basically get in a fucking conga line in my cockpit to tell me to my face 
one at a time how much of a fucking idiot I am for picking the cool looking giraffes with actual documented success in being introduced to new ecosystems over the virus that is controlled by a governing body with a shady history of war crimes. Even Sarah had the gall to tell me that I should have trusted the science. I did trust the science. I trusted the verbally expressed successes of previous trials involving the introduction of the Asilis to alien planets. That is science. What's more, if your player character has a xenobiologist background and specializes in this sort of thing, Sarah still thinks you're an idiot. But either way, that's still not good enough for them. The game didn't even allow me to explain my choice to them in depth. I just had to stand there like a moron and let them lecture me one at a time while they accused me of underestimating the Terramorph threat or misunderstanding the science. Even worse, before I made the final decision, some of them voiced a preference for the Asili's choice and still questioned me when I actually picked it. The ending of that quest line felt like a really shitty COVID analogy, but the writers were too scientifically illiterate to do it properly. This entire sequence murdered my desire to not only take any of my companions seriously, but to travel with them at all. They're just a bunch of goody-two-shoes snobs who spout the same bullshit with slightly different words. It would have made sense for one or two of them to voice disapproval. I can understand Barrett leaning a tiny bit towards the microbe, maybe even Andrea, but all of them? Now some of you might be wondering, well, why not have an evil companion if you're tired of Constellation? And the answer is simple. There is no evil companion. There's an entire quest line where you can join the Crimson Fleet Pirates, and it introduces several named characters who could potentially fill in the role of an evil companion, but none of them do. The game has an abundantly clear slant towards your character being a good person, to the point where any instance that you're allowed to be an asshole feels like something Bethesda only begrudgingly allowed. All of this is to say that interactions with your travel buddies can be very, very hit or miss. For me, I considered most of it misses. Even when I got them to like me enough that they started trauma dumping their past on me and forcing me to play therapist, I could barely get myself to care. They do have their moments of being charming and entertaining, but they're often just bland and suffer too much from being, well, obvious video game travel companions and nothing more than that. This actually leads me to something that took a while to even put my finger on, but once I realized what it was, it bugged me for the entire rest of the game. The horrible NPC animations, particularly when talking. I don't know what happened, but in Skyrim and Fallout 4, it was possible to talk to NPCs while they were engaging in other activities. For some weird reason, Starfield is no longer capable of this, and every NPC has this weird, annoying, and frankly time-wasting transition animation you have to wait for them to do before they actually engage with you. They have to turn and lock their eyes with you before the conversation can truly begin. And on top of that, Characters have no personality whatsoever in how they move, including your constellation companions. I feel like everyone is basically a talking mannequin. They're all stiff and show no character in their movement. And when you finally notice this, it makes a lot of interactions awkward at best and downright immersion shattering at worst. Bethesda's weakness with animations is still here after all these years and it's sadly stronger than ever. Now, some people might take this moment to ask, well, what about taking time to explore planets and moons and make your own adventure? Wouldn't that be a fun distraction from the repetitive main quest line or weird interactions with NPCs? Sure, for a few hours, it would be, until I realized that all the points of interest on any given planet or moon are just procedurally generated trash with no meaningful rewards to be found in almost any of the 
hundreds or thousands of same looking caves, mines, and labs. I realized how utterly useless exploration was when I ventured to Pluto's moon. It was the most remote location in humanity's home star system, so I figured the developers must have put something half interesting on it. I scanned my surroundings, and much to my expectations, it was barren, because why wouldn't it be? But I picked up the presence of a cave, about a full kilometer away. So I sprinted and jumped towards it, I'll touch on that in a bit, and walked inside, expecting a decently large maze with something cool in it, maybe a rare gun at least. Sadly, the reality was far less interesting. Instead, the cave was a single room with one useless looping path leading from one side to the other. The only loot in the cave was a single toolbox with one unit of an uncommon resource that I didn't even use that often. This was the straw that broke the camel's back for me and put a big spotlight on how futile, unfulfilling, and time-wasting exploration actually is in this game. Assuming you're not following any mission objective and you're doing actual exploration on your own, your only real activities are diving into caves that might have literally nothing in them or blasting your way into mines or labs inhabited by the same group of human enemies. If you're really lucky, you'll fight some local fauna to spice things up a bit. That's all. Just like with the main questline, it's repetitious garbage meant to get you to sink time into, and it's equally mind-numbing and equally wasteful of any potential the game might have had in this area. It just goes to show that substituting a carefully handcrafted world with countless square kilometers of procedurally generated shit is not going to end up with a similar experience being offered. Almost 12 years ago when Skyrim came out, I at least felt that sense of adventure. When I wandered into a cave or mine, I knew I was going to get something out of it. I knew something was waiting for me inside. Sure, some of those dungeons ended up being pretty samey in their own right. That was something I also complained about back then. But at least they weren't single room hole in the walls with one common sword in them or whatever. It was never a concern that I would enter this mysterious new location and immediately discover that my time getting there was a total fucking waste. Starfield would have been such a better experience with three or four planets with large handmade maps and then supplemented with a few dozen procedurally generated ones. The sense of wonderment in Starfield is basically limited to landing on a new planet or moon and looking up at the cool view of its star or neighbors. Then you're struck by reality that now you're about to spend the next three minutes heading to a potentially empty point of interest on foot. Which leads me to my next complaint about exploration. The lack of land vehicles. Starfield takes place in a world where any middle class or at least upper middle class person can afford a ship that can comfortably fit a family of four, with a grav drive that can take them across the galaxy in an instant. But for some reason, none of these ships have an onboard garage for at least an ATV. In fact, from what I can tell, wheeled vehicles no longer seem to exist at all in this universe. In a game where you can spend hundreds of hours fully exploring one planet by landing in numerous different spots and visiting a theoretically endless number of points of interest, it seems like a pretty deliberate attempt to inflate the average person's playtime by not giving them a damn bike to ride across the kilometers of nothing between those points of interest. Again, it feels like Bethesda trying to sabotage their own experience. I can't imagine it would be an engine limitation considering how fast you can fly past other ships and various visual assets in space, but I could be surprised. Another issue relating to on-foot exploration is the lack of local maps for cities, namely New Atlantis, Aquila City, and Neon. These places range from somewhat large to 
quite huge, at least as far as Bethesda game cities go. And while it is possible to learn their layouts after several hours of exploration and repeat visits, it could cut the middleman out entirely to just give us a damn local map for them. There's no way it could have been that difficult to implement. New Atlantis especially has some big districts with a dozen or so enterable buildings, and most are stores you might like to return to, and it may take several visits before you stop getting lost on the way. Neon's main section is actually pretty simple, because it's literally a straight line. But once you exit out to Ebside, the exterior section of the city, it's gonna seem like a fucking maze until you memorize it. Let's finally move on to combat-related stuff. I know I said I enjoyed combat, and that is still true. But there are subjects and topics adjacent and related to combat and equipment that I very much do not like. First is the trait system. For those who don't know, Starfield weapons and gear do have rarity tiers. Four of them, to be exact. From Common, which has no bonus traits, to Legendary, which has three. Obviously, these traits are randomized, but with luck, you'll find a Legendary with three traits that absolutely match your playstyle, and you'll probably end up having it on you for the rest of the game. This sounds all well and good so far, until you get a Legendary that has two good traits that help you a lot, and one bad trait that works against you. In basically every other RPG with this type of system, you're allowed to go somewhere that removes or re-rolls a trait. Sounds like a small feature that no studio who knows what they're actually doing would forget to include, right? Well, guess what Starfield doesn't have? That's right, if you find a legendary with a trait that is completely at odds with how you play, it could render the weapon almost worthless despite everything else about it. And there's nothing you can do to change it. I can't even begin to count how many epic or legendary weapons I've found that are made almost useless because of the Space Adept trait that increases damage by 30% when you're in orbit, but decreases damage by 15% when you're on a planetary surface. How often does this game think that I fuck around in space stations that it insists on giving me this trait like a third of the time? I almost never board enemy ships, so this trait means absolutely nothing to me, so it'd be nice to get rid of it. On top of that, why are debuffs on legendary weapons at all? I wouldn't be irritated by Space Adept to begin with if it weren't for that damage debuff on planets. It doesn't need to be there to illustrate the usefulness of the weapon in space. Next is weapon viability, specifically a very, very disappointing lack of multiple weapon types. First is the lack of laser weapons. There's only three proper laser guns, the Solstice, Equinox, and Orion. But if you want to stretch it, there's also the Cutter and Arc Welder. On the other hand, there's a whopping 33 ballistic weapons covering every conceivable weapon type. Handgun, shotgun, rifle, heavy weapon, etc. Lasers are woefully underutilized in this setting. And after just coming off of Armored Core 6, there's plenty of potential for lasers in far future sci-fi settings. Second is the horrible drought of melee weapons. You're telling me, across the entire galaxy, there's only five types of knives, two types of swords, one type of axe, and only one type of fist weapon? And on top of that, they can't even be modded or upgraded beyond crossing your fingers for a rare drop since there's no way of adding your own traits. As I mentioned earlier, I enjoy the general feeling of combat, but laser and melee weapons are seriously lacking in variety. The latter is especially frustrating, considering this studio is responsible for Elder Scrolls, a fantasy game with almost nothing but melee weapons. The available arsenal for these categories is so bad, I'd go so far as to say that spending skill points on any skill relating to them is bordering on being a trap to waste them. And that finally leads us to skills themselves. The skill tree in Starfield makes sense on paper. There's five categories of skills, physical, social, science, 
combat, and tech. And each category is divided into four tiers, novice, advanced, expert, and master. And each skill in each tier has four ranks, with each rank being significantly more powerful than the last. You get one skill point per level, and each rank for each skill costs one skill point. There's a grand total of 82 skills. Multiply that by four ranks each, and you need to be level 328 to max out all of them. That's a lot of levels. But at the same time, it forces you to zero in on stuff you actually care about and prioritize the right skills for your desired playstyle. But here's where things get complicated. Leveling up in this game is slow. It can take up to an hour and a half to gain one level, assuming you haven't already resorted to some very boring and repetitious grinding method. For reference, at hour 50 of my playthrough, I was only at level 40, meaning my entire skill tree was only 12% unlocked. 50 hours and I haven't even acquired a fifth of all skill ranks. If my pace stays the same and I don't throw my hands up in defeat and do some gimmicky grinding strategy, then it'll take 400 hours to finally max everything out. In a vacuum, this isn't a problem. There's nothing inherently wrong about slow leveling and requiring a very steep time commitment to allow the player to be a master at everything. But, as we've established by now, Starfield hates having basic quality of life features that many other RPGs have. And that includes the option to respec. A common hand wave for this egregious exclusion of a very basic convenience is that you can just keep leveling because there's no cap anyway. And if there's no cap, there's no need for respecking. If you put several, or even just a few, points into skills that you end up either not needing as much, not liking as much, or noticing are completely worthless, there's no way to get those points back. You'll simply have to put several more hours into the game to put new points into the skills you actually want. And on top of that, the lack of a level cap is not an excuse to leave out respects. Another RPG series that also technically does not have a cap, but still had respecking for almost a decade now, is Dark Souls, a series that is centered around challenge and sparks an annoying discussion about difficulty every time a new entry comes out. If From Software understood the importance and convenience of respecking despite all that, then there's no excuse for Bethesda to leave out such a brain-dead obvious quality of life feature. And From isn't the only one. The two other big RPGs sandwiching or spit-roasting Starfield on the release calendar Baldur's Gate 3 and Cyberpunk 2077 2.0 also have respec mechanics, and those games also have lengthy time commitments, especially the former, which can take well over 100 hours to finish. Cyberpunk's respecking is especially simple, because you can do it literally any time you open the pause menu. And skills are part of yet another major issue relating to weapons and gear. Modding. But this part isn't going to go the way you might expect, because I think the actual process of modding is quite fun and interesting. It's not super in-depth or given a particularly gigantic focus like Call of Duty or something, but modding does enough to let you make your weapon your own. And of course, there's also spacesuit modding, chemistry workstations for medicine, and cooking workstations for food. They all work more or less the same way, but Let's be honest here, it's the weapon modding that we're most likely to care about, and why wouldn't we be? Taking any old pea shooter and turning it into a cannon is very satisfying, especially since you can give it a name and truly make it unique. But some of you may be asking, hold on a second, if you enjoy modding, then why wasn't it mentioned in the section of things you like? Well, that's the million dollar question, and I'm going to answer it. Modding has one big frustrating weakness, and it is redundancy. To put it simply, modding has a long, tedious extra step in the entire process of unlocking and expanding mod capabilities that doesn't need to be there. Let's start from the top. I already went over how long it takes to level up and gain skills. Well, as you might expect, every type of modding has its own separate skill in the tree. 
Meaning, if you want to max out weapon mods, you'll need to spend 4 skill points on the skill dedicated to weapon modding. If you want to max out suit mods, you need to spend 4 points on the skill dedicated to suit modding. So on and so forth. If you want both, that means you need to level up 8 times. However, it's still not that simple. I mentioned that skills are divided into tiers. Novice, Advanced, Expert, and Master. You need to spend 4 points in Novice skills to unlock Advanced skills, and both Weapon Engineering and Spacesuit Design skills are in the Advanced tier. So in actuality, you need to level up 4 times to spend those points in Novice skills, and then you level up 8 times to spend those on those mod skills, meaning 12 levels in total. You're looking at anywhere between 10 to 15 hours of gameplay just to unlock the majority of weapon and suit modding capabilities. And that's if you beeline straight to them and ignore everything else. Which is difficult to do because other skills similarly unlock more content, like starship design, medicine, outpost engineering, and chemistry. And guess what? Even after you spend those hours getting those skill points and spending them, you're still not ready to actually begin modding. You need to spend resources you would otherwise use on the modding itself to research the mods and finally unlock them. This is the step that is wholly unnecessary and completely wasteful of resources. It's just another barrier meant to make you spend all the materials you gathered. And of course, there's a skill in the skill tree that can reduce the amount of resources needed to do this research. Ugh. It's a system that you would see in a mobile game. The entire research step is nothing short of a time waster. It's an annoying middleman, a useless gate. There is no reason whatsoever that we can't just go straight to modding once we get the skill. And speaking of resources, there's a couple things related to them that I want to touch on. First is the user interface when buying resources from vendors. In a game where crafting and modding plays such a big role in how you play, why is there no indication in the vendor's menu of how many units I have of the resource I am highlighting? There are dozens and dozens of materials and resources. I cannot possibly be expected to keep track of how many I have stored in my cargo at any given time. There needs to be an Amount Owned section of the UI when browsing items at vendors. Again, it's just another extremely basic quality of life detail that almost every other half-decent RPG knows to include, and I cannot for the life of me understand why it's not here. This should also be applied to ammo too. And another point on vendors, why are they so fucking broke? Most only have several thousand credits on them at once, and that's typically not even enough to afford the most expensive item they have in their own inventory. Vendors have such a pathetic amount of money on them that I have to travel to multiple different ones to finally sell all the weapons and suits I picked from the corpses of pirates I slayed at the 18 same looking labs I cleared out while mindlessly exploring. Even the Trade Authority kiosk, which realistically wouldn't even have any hard cash inside it in this setting, has only a few thousand to offer. This whole system is just another bothersome procedure with needless extra steps. There's no point in vendors having such a limited amount of money on them. You know what I do when I've cleaned up all their savings? I don't drop all of my leftovers on the ground and give up. I just sit in a chair and wait 24 to 48 in-game hours for them to replenish that cash. There's no need for that. Just give them more cash on hand. Add a single zero to their usual amount, so 6,000 becomes 60,000. That is much more reasonable. And while we're at it, the Trade Authority kiosk should have infinite money, but also buys your loot at about 10 to 15% less than human vendors. I think that would be a great trade-off. Another thing besides modding that you end up spending resources on is base building. You probably noticed by now that base building was not in the things I like section, despite shipbuilding being the very first thing I mentioned. Well, there's a reason for that. 
and it's a little bit complicated, because base building can be fun depending on how committed you are to it. Whereas ship building feels significant no matter what small part of your ship you upgrade, base building is a completely optional thing that honestly takes a lot of work before it feels like it contributes anything to your playthrough at all. Sure, at the moment you can use base building very quickly for some cheap farming tactics and maybe some very small but helpful things like a quick place to sleep or get small buffs. But if you really want to buckle down and create an outpost worthy of calling home that offers a ton of game-changing benefits, then you need to spend way more time, money, resources, and hours on it than all of your ships combined before you finally make a little settlement that doesn't feel like it's there purely for the sake of existing. The one aspect of base building that is probably beneficial to almost everybody who is playing this game is just having a place to send crew members to relax at when your ship is full. At the end of the day, this is probably a good thing, because unless outposts are buffed in some way to be much more contributive in bigger ways, then it would be a pain in the ass if they were required in any respect. You can have fun with base building, but not if you're going into it half-cocked. So unless you truly, truly wish to build and fully commit yourself, it's safer and probably more resource efficient to just never bother with it. And somewhat related to Outposts is the Star Map, the interactive 3D map of the explorable galaxy you'll be using to get around. I do love the presentation of it, but like with many other UI issues in the game, it lacks succinctness and features that could greatly cut down on menu navigation time. For example, a search function or a favorites list. There are a thousand planets and moons to land on, so it's kinda nutty to me that a favorites function wasn't added. It could be used to make travel to your outposts or any other location important to the player so much easier. It should go without saying that remembering the names of several hundred celestial bodies is kind of a tall ask for the average player. In addition to that, having all locations in list form with the ability to sort by resources or font account would be extremely convenient and time-saving too. But once again, this is where I segue into another issue related to the thing I'm currently talking about. Interruptions. As much as I like the presentation of the star map and the potential usefulness it could have if Bethesda added a favorites function and list sorting, it is still part of a greater problem plaguing this game. Constant pauses in gameplay, usually in the form of loading screens. Because Starfield is a spacefaring game, fast travel is the main mode of transportation between systems, and I can understand why. But the issue is compounded by the fact that the world is still divided between loading screens every time you enter a new building or go back outside. The complete lack of seamlessness in this game makes it feel like you're having control taken away from you constantly. For a studio the size of Bethesda, and considering how many years it takes for them to make a game, it's kind of disappointing they can't accomplish something that smaller developers were able to pull off years ago. It feels like every couple minutes is punctuated by a menu you need to open or a new room you need to enter that requires a load. It's especially annoying when you have a mission that requires visiting multiple planets just to talk to a few NPCs, and it feels like a third of the entire mission is spent looking at menus or waiting for something to load. For a game that so blatantly prioritizes scope and scale, it's completely handicapped by the incessant interruptions. Finally, let's discuss the resolution of the game, and something that created a controversial sort of its own discourse before the game even came out. New Game Plus. Many reviewers, streamers, journalists, YouTubers, anyone who received early access to the game began spouting advice on how to play the game in the most effective way. Namely, they suggested speeding through New Game to get to New Game Plus as soon as possible, then begin your slow, leisurely playthrough there. It seemed like very, very weird advice, and it is. 
I don't think I've ever seen anything remotely close to a similar discussion for any RPG that offers a new game plus. But I kept my mind open. I wasn't going to do it, I was still going to take my time through my first playthrough. But I was going to keep my attention on how the game changes over time and what exactly is introduced in New Game Plus that makes it so special that so many people with influence would suggest such a crazy thing. Well, I got to the end of the game, and, using a new save slot, I entered New Game Plus. And all I can say is, wow, it's absolutely fucking nothing. Starfield's New Game Plus has got to be the most overblown New Game Plus I have ever had the displeasure of experiencing. Once I entered my new universe with this dog shit new spaceship I can't even modify and a one piece spacesuit I can't improve, I became totally dumbfounded as to why any fool would be up in arms about this. The only significant piece of content that New Game Plus offers is the opportunity to do more of those shitty, tedious temples so you can get more space powers or upgrade the ones you already have. That's it. That's the only benefit. And honestly, none of the powers are so great that you would need to change the way you play to dedicate yourself to them to begin with. If you haven't played the game or know anything about New Game Plus, then you might be thinking, well, at least all your progress carries over, right? Wrong. The only thing you keep when entering New Game Plus is your level and skills. Everything else, your ships, your weapons, your gear, your outposts, your money, are all tossed away. Meaning, if you want to go on a journey for more of these powers, you're probably not even likely to use that often. You need to sacrifice literally everything, including stuff you might have spent dozens of hours on because it all resets. This is where the ridiculously shallow and honestly kind of insulting excuse comes in that it's supposed to be that way because that's what the story sets up. That's the choice you're given. You pick contentment in your original universe or you sacrifice everything for the pursuit of power. And I get that. The game isn't even subtle about it because it basically has multiple characters look at the camera and say it to you. The problem here is that the choice isn't even a difficult one to make. Staying in your original New Game Universe is objectively the better experience as a video game. And I've seen almost exclusively regret from people who went into New Game Plus after dedicating a ton of time and effort into things like building their ideal ships and huge sprawling outposts not knowing what they were getting themselves into. Even worse, you don't even get to choose a new background or set of traits for your character when you make the jump. If the game at least offered that, New Game Plus would be somewhat tempting. But as it stands, the only reason you should ever bother with going into New Game Plus is if you've always known what it does and you speed through New Game with the intent of jumping into it. And lastly, if I'm being totally honest here, the idea that this ending was super hard-hitting and impactful is insane. I've seen at least one comparison to the endings of Near Replicant and Automata. And let me be loud and clear here. The narrative of Starfield isn't even good enough to shine Near's shoes. A story that rides on the back of a bunch of fetch quests starring a bunch of dimwit characters I don't even like to hang out with was never going to give me an emotional ending. Ever. Some people might fall for the sudden wow factor at the end, but I did not. I'm extremely disappointed in all of the reviewers, journalists, and content creators who joined in on the advice of rushing through New Game to get to New Game Plus, because it is such a patently wasteful and pointless idea. If you made it to this point in the review and you still wish to play Starfield, Take your time playing regular New Game, please. If there's one thing I want you to absorb and internalize from this review, it is to completely ignore the downright foolish advice of rushing through New Game to get to New Game Plus. <sighs> and this is where I'm going to end the review. Not because I've run out of things to say, but because I'm kind of exhausted. This script ended up being a good four or five pages longer than I anticipated, and for reference, one page usually translates to about five minutes of video time. 
I had no idea I was disappointed in the game this much until I started writing my thoughts down. I don't know if I've ever played a game stuffed with as many half-baked, half-hearted, and potential wasting ideas as Starfield. It's a game made up entirely of half measures and a lack of commitment despite how often it seeks to waste your time with tedium, repetition, and unnecessary extra steps. I don't think I've ever played a game that's as blatantly anti-convenience as this. Starfield seems to despise the idea of having decent quality of life features that every other game in its genre has. It seems to hate allowing the player to be efficient and use mechanics and systems to their fullest capabilities. Worse still, it's a game that constantly interrupts you and takes control away with probably the highest density of load screen appearances and menu navigation I've had to deal with in any single player game I've ever touched. And as the subpar cherry on top of this mediocre cake, the game still suffers from Bethesda's typical awful character animations that makes everyone look stiff and robotic. I don't know what the future holds for this game. It's easy to assume Bethesda might fix things in updates or expansions, but I'm not going to hold my breath. I expect future DLC to simply add a few quest lines and maybe a few more non-committal mechanics. Perhaps small quality of life features might make it in, like showing the number of resources and ammo you already own while navigating vendor inventories, or a favorites list on the star map but that's still only putting a band-aid on a broken bone. A shamelessly cynical voice in my head is telling me that Bethesda will likely leave all of this stuff to mods, especially when the Creation Club is out. But I think a lot of us expect that anyway. Once again, a Bethesda RPG has let me down immensely, all because I wanted something of a little more substance beyond their usual focus of scope and wow factor. This game is the definition of mile wide, inch deep. Two years ago, I never thought I would say this, but I'm gonna wash the taste of Starfield out of my mouth by going back to Cyberpunk 2077, and maybe even a new run at Baldur's Gate 3. If you own either of those games, I recommend doing the same instead of spending any time on Starfield. But hey, it's your call at the end of the day. This concludes my review of Starfield. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you around.